Hey guys, so now let's talk about corticosteroids for a minute and uh, really bes besides corticosteroids let's talk about dermatological therapy as in the title of the video. So regarding the title of the video dermatological therapy, uh, the thing that we want to keep in mind is number one, when we're talking about therapy or medications that's typically used for skin infections, uh, a lot of the principles, a lot of the things that we're going to mention applies both to a GP as well as to a dermatologist. The only difference is a dermatologist will go into a little bit more details and he'll be dealing with a bit of the medications that are very, very potent, such as specific classes of topical steroids. So let's talk about dermatological therapy for a minute. So the, th the thing we're going to talk about is topical medications, medications in which you can apply in the skin. Now we've heard the term topical medication a lot of times, uh, especially in the case of skin infections, but the commonly the ones that we use topically as medications or the physicians what they use as topically for medications, they come in different variety of forms or in different variety of vehicles. Way to administer a drug topically through the skin can be in the form of an ointment, can be as a cream, can be as a form of a lotion, an oil, gel, whatever. But so there are many many ways of applying a medication topically. But before we go into the, I guess you could say the types of topical medications or the ways in which you could administer a medication to the skin topically. Before we talk about the types, let's go through the principles or let's go through what makes a topical medication effective. What goes into the efficacy of a topical medication? Because every topical medication differs from one another. So if we look at this one right here, the principles of topical medication or what makes a topical medication efficient are four things. A, A, V, C. The first two are important. A stands for the anatomy. We want to see where we will apply the medication on the skin. Is it going to be in a skin that's non-hairy or is it going to be on a skin that's very hairy, for example? Or is it going to be on a skin that's relatively dry? or in a skin that's very wet, meaning a skin that secretes a lot of secretions like sweat, like oil, sebum, let's say. So especially those in the armpit and especially those in the groin. So A stands for the anatomical site. We want to see the anatomy where we will apply this. For example, if you were to apply a topical medication on your palm, it could be a very, very potent topical medication. But if you were to apply it on your palm, it's not going to be as effective as, as, as if you were going to apply it in your armpit. And the reason why there could be a difference in potency when you apply it on your palm compared to your armpit is because when we talk, look at wet areas of the skin, it's basically areas of the skin that secrete a lot of stuff, like your armpit that secretes your secretion. And it's above. Basically, as a principle, whenever you have a wet area in the skin, that basically allows for a better chance for this medication that we apply topically to be, to be absorbed rapidly. Typically medications, there is rapid absorption whenever there is water. But if you're in a dry area like a desert, then there will be uh, basically more difficulty in absorption. We'll come to that. But the A stands for anatomical site. The second A stands for the active ingredient. Some medications, especially when we look at corticosteroids topically, we'll see that topical steroids, there are certain classes that they divide it as. And these classes are separated according to the active ingredient found in this medication, not the concentration. This ingredient that is active that's actually doing its anti-inflammatory effect, for example, in corticosteroids. So that's one thing that goes into the efficacy of a medication. The V stands for the vehicle, the mode of transportation the mode of which we will apply our medication in the skin. So an example of a vehicle can be ointments, creams, lotion, foams, and so forth. And some certain vehicles are more potent or are more stronger than the other. For example, the most important ones clinically are ointments, creams, and lotions. Typically, ointments are the more stronger ones. They're very, very strong in their effect compared to its brethren. But we'll look into that later on. Uh, besides the V, the last one is C. Now C refers to the concentration of the medication. How much concentration? In some topical medication, again like corticosteroids, you might see, for example, hydrocortisone, 1%. 
that 1% represents the amount of concentration that this medication has. But you will see later on, especially with corticosteroids, what makes a steroid potent isn't its concentration. It is its active ingredient. What is in that steroid specifically, for example. But that goes into its efficacy. So D is A, A, V, C, anatomy, active ingredient, vehicle, and concentration. They determine the efficacy of any topical medication. All right, then one of the examples could be topical corticosteroids, okay? So now that we've got that out of the way, now let's talk about the vehicles, all right? Now, there are different types of vehicles, different types of transportation you could uh, send the drug to penetrate inside the skin, all right? And we mentioned before, when we mean the skin, when we, whenever we give the patient a topical medication, we want to think which area of the skin. Is it hairy? Is it non-hairy? Is it a sick skin or is it a thin skin? Thick or thin? Uh, uh, dry or wet? Or let's say, uh, besides wet or dry, hairy, non-hairy. So hairy, non-hairy, wet and dry, thick and skin, skin areas. These sites can determine, all right, where we will apply our topical medications because this will determine their indication and their contraindications. Now I said previously, topical medications their absorption is much, much more faster whenever we have water. Because with water, the medication can be absorbed very rapidly. But if in a skin is dry, let's say with a lot of fat, or let's say in general dryness, this will make it very difficult for the medication to be absorbed locally. It will be difficult for it to be able to penetrate inside the skin to reach its local destination in the dermis, right? To do its local effect. So that's why, if you, like we said before in the example previously, if you were to apply a medication on your palm, a very strong potent medication, if you were to apply it in your palm and you apply it on your armpit, the one in your armpit, despite the potency is the same, the one you apply in your, in your armpit will be much more stronger in its effect than the palm because typically the armpit are considered wet areas where they secrete secretion. But the palm, not necessarily so, unless you're in a form of exercise, okay? So now that we've got that idea in mind, let's look at these certain vehicles. So the first vehicle is an ointment. Now ointments are really a type of moisturizer. Basically, now that we've got the principle that medications are better in their effect whenever we have a case of water, then how about we have some form of moisturizer? How about we take the active ingredient of a medication and we put it in a boat and this boat will call it a moisturizer and this moisturizer will lead its active ingredient towards its target site which is deep inside the skin so that's what moisturizer is they will moisturize the skin they can make it wet fill it with water so that our medication can penetrate deep through and the way to attract water is not from thin air the way to attract water in the skin by these moisturizers can be one of two ways. It can be osmotic, osmotic, or it could be occlusive. The difference between the two, well, starting with osmotic, is osmotic, osmotic pressure. Water likes to follow in areas that have a lot high amounts of solutes, concentration. So let's say we have a cream and it has a solute known as a urea. A urea could be seen as a tract that we put inside this cream in our skin and this urea will be acting as a, a trap for water to follow. So any water in the skin can follow this urea in the cream because water likes to follow a solute, especially high amounts of solute concentration, they call this osmosis, where they follow it and thus water can be in the skin. So we can have certain types of moisturizer that can manipulate the osmotic pressure in your skin to attract water in and trap it. And we have water in our skin, that means and of course, we have water in our skin through moisturizer, then that means the medication can penetrate through the screen easily and do its effect. The other type of moisturizer that has the same idea is occlusive. Occlusive basically means that we can have a form of an oil, all right? We'll have like an ointment, which is a mixture of water and oil. Same goes for cream. Well, creams and ointments are two, are two different types of vehicles that consist of the same thing, water and oil. The only difference is that in ointments, we have large amounts of oil over the water. But the idea, let's say, with ointments is that we will have an oil that acts as a sticky trap. We're going to have oil here with a lot of water, all right? And this oil will basically act as a trap. 
it will attract the water in the skin and tell it to come here all right come here come here this oil this oil will tell the water to come here and the water once it comes in contact with the oil part of the ointment it will be trapped all right so there will be a layer created by an ointment and for example vaseline in which this layer this oil layer it will trap a lot of this water in the skin in and this will moisturize our skin and if it moisturizes our skin that means the medication can also penetrate through that's why they term it occlusive we're basically going to form an oily layer to bring the water in trap it let the medication penetrate through okay the other one is the cream. The cream is basically more water than oil, and it has the same concept in mind with the oil. The only difference is that with cream, we have more concentration of water than oil in its compartment, okay? That's pretty much it, the same idea. It typically follows through osmotic, all right? And of course, there's a form of cream, steroid, urea cream, again. So let's go back to the vehicles for a minute. So with the ointments, the first one, the one of the most important ones and the stronger ones, uh, an ointment has an example like Vaseline, and this ointment has the ability to be lubricative. It can lubricate the skin, and we mentioned how. It basically has a way to lubricate the skin and has an ability to moisturize the skin in the form of occlusive moisturization, okay? And the thing is, if the, osmo if the ointments like Vaseline, if they're able to moisturize the skin, all right, then you can think of it that if I'm going to apply an ointment, if I'm going to prescribe a patient an ointment, then I can give this patient ointments in the case of dry skin areas, right? I want to, I want to use it to moisturize the skin. So I, it's not logic that I'll use it in the armpit or I'll use it in the groin. I'll use it in skin areas that are dry, very dry areas, for example, or very thick skin, like in people with cirrhosis, for example. For example, so I can use a form of an ointment, especially in very dry skin, all right? Or let's say smooth, non-hairy skin, let's say, a skin that's basically without hair as well, because if we apply an ointment in the skin that has a lot of hair in it, like in the pubic, for example, then this will have difficulty in its absorption, all right? Because remember, ointments work through occlusive moisturization. The oil basically in the hair could get clogged up. It can make it difficult for the, med the medicine or for the active ingredient to penetrate through. So you can think of ointments, I think, that we can use in cases of dry skin. We can use it in case of smooth, non-hairy skin, all right? Now that's besides ointments, one of the stronger ones that are very, very greasy in nature, okay? Besides ointments, we have creams. Now, creams are less greasy. They're the ones that mostly work through osmotic effect. They consist of really the same moisturization, you know, the component water and oil as ointments, and they have a drying effect. You see, the thing about ointments is when you apply it, they tend to fade off for a while. They fade off and they disappear. So you apply it for a minute, and then after like an hour, it disappears the cream, all right? And that's because the cream, like we said, it contains more water than oil. And, see, and here's the thing, the water, the water component of this, really this cream, the water tends to evaporate a lot more easily, especially in the cream part. So the thing about water, or the thing about cream, when you apply it, it has a drying effect. Because the water, the high content of water in this cream tends to evaporate a lot easily. There's less oil compartment in this area. So there's more of a chance for this cream to be dried off with evaporation with the air and whatnot. All right? And this gives it a drying effect. This basically means that this cream is not really used for dry skin areas. You can use it in cases of wet areas, especially areas in which a patient has a case of acute eczema, where you can have a case of a very wet area, and in that wet area you can apply a cream. That cream can be anything. It could be steroid or anything. So you can give a cream, especially in, in the case of wet areas, the opposite of ointments. And it's because the water component of this cream tends to evaporate a lot easily once you apply it, all right? This is unlike the ointments, the opposite, okay? So this basically with the creams being done. So ointments can be used in dry skin areas, smooth, non-hairy skin, while the cream areas can be used in wet areas, all right? And in cases of acute eczema, all right? So of course, what about in ointments? Let's see back to eczema. Let's say we have a case of coronic eczema, where the skin tends to be dry. Do I, use, do I continue to use cream? No, I will use ointments as well. So ointments can be used in coronic eczema, dry and hairy skin, but the creams can be used in wet areas, especially in cases of acute eczema. Of course, the contraindication for both is the opposite of their indication, okay? That's it.
Now, the third most important vehicle is the lotion. The lotion is basically another vehicle that contains high amounts of not oil, but alcohol. Again, it's less greasy than compared to ointments in its nature and its effect, but it contains alcohol. And the thing about alcohol, it allows you to penetrate through the skin a lot easier. So the thing about lotions is that they have a lot of alcohol and a lot of water content. And with this component, it has an ability to basically act the same as a cream, but a little bit better, all right? It has another, again, drying effect. And the thing about lotion is that they can thus be used in very wet areas. So to say, you can think of it the same indication as a cream, but in very wet areas. It has a very easy ability to penetrate to the skin, thanks to the alcohol. So it doesn't need oil, it needs alcohol, it can penetrate the skin very easily. And because it has high contents of water that can evaporate, it can lead to dryness of the skin, there's no lack of water. So it can lead to a drying effect, and thus we can use it in very wet areas, and especially in hairy areas. We say in cases of skin that's hairy, we don't use ointments, because with the oil, it makes it difficult for the medication to penetrate through. But in the case of lotion, nah. We can use a lotion, especially in hairy areas, especially with sex with the alcohol rather than the oil, that can allow for the medication to penetrate through. Now, besides the lotion, we also have foams. Foams are very infamous in the case of cosmetics. They're very expensive. They use people with cosmetics, essentially, for their skin. And typically, foams are, again, also used for the same indication as lotion. They're just a little bit more expensive, and it's used in the case of hairy areas and very wet areas as well. Besides the foams, we have a case of a spray. You can have a spray, and the most infamous spray of them all is a case of minoxidil. Some people use minoxidil spray in case of alopecia. So if a patient has androgenic alopecia, all right, then in that case of that type of androgenic alopecia, they tend to use minoxidil as a spray. And that's really its most common medication, but it's not really used as often uh, nowadays. Uh, besides the spray, you have a case of an oil. Oil, you can basically have an oil in a case of curly hair. So some people use oil, especially for cosmetics, or especially if they have very curly hair, like mine, when I tend to grow an afro. So I, I can use an oil on my scalp, since it tends to be dry, and I can basically moisturize the skin in a way, all right? So this is in the case of pure oil. You can use oil in the case of applying it on the scalp, especially in very curly hairs. Besides the oil, we have a case of a gel, jelly-like. And in this one, this can be used especially in cases of acne vulgaris. And in this one, it's basically very, very convenient to use. Where a patient who has an acne, he can apply gel on his face and he won't even feel, or people won't even see the gel. The gel will be basically applied on the skin and after a while, it will fade off. It's as if the patient never applied it. But especially in the cases of gel, again, the same concept. It's especially used in cases of acne. All right, especially for these lesions, to basically allow them to be not be irritated, irritated. Okay, so that's pretty much it. And the only thing we want to mention, another point is typically those that have a drying effect, such as creams and lotions, that could be a side effect of irritation, right? Because with dryness of the skin can cause irritation. That is something also to keep in mind as well, uh, as a possible uh, complaint that a patient might have. But again, it's not as serious as a problem. Okay. And that's pretty much it for the vehicles, the types of vehicles for topical medications in general. The most common or the most important ones really that's typically used are, again, ointments, creams, and lotions in that order. And then maybe spray in cases of alopecia, okay? That's pretty much it for the vehicles. Now, now that we finish with the topical medications, let's talk about topical medications, the costs. Of course, you don't just prescribe a patient any topical medication. Whenever you prescribe a patient topical medication, the patient, or you as well, you should be thinking of two things. Will this, will this topical medication cover this patient's insurance? Will the insurance company cover his topical medication price? And number two, is it expensive or not? Because the problem with topical medication, if you tell this patient, uh, give him topical steroids, you give him like a brand name or something, this, pa this patient, uh, he might go to the pharmacist and then he'll see it's not covered by his insurance and it's very expensive. So instead of cornering the patient to this corner, you know, instead of putting the patient in this corner and letting him decide and all that, you should be able to know the generic name of the medication and give it to the patient or give it to the pharmacist. So basically the idea with topical medications uh, is do we think about the cost? That's the idea. Do we think about the price? and costs of topical medication? And the answer is yes. 
We can't just give this, we just can't give a patient any type of communication. We have to think about the price and whether it's covered by insurance. That's why whenever you give a patient topical medication, make sure that you put in your description or in your prescription, let's say, in your prescription, the following. So this is the following that you add in your prescription for the topical medication in order to make it easy for the patient. The patient might not know the drug is part of his insurance, and if the patient discovers that this drug is expensive, then he might not come to you again. So to ensure that the patient buys a medication that's low cost as well as effective, and as a bonus, it's covered by his insurance, in order to make sure this, this patient takes a medication that's suited for him and continues to follow up with you, you write the following things in your prescription. So the things you write in your prescription is G, V, C, S, A, R. So G stands for the generic name. You have to give the generic name of the drug because there's many brands for a drug, like certain types of creams, for example. So I have to give the generic name and then when he goes to the pharmacist, he can choose the brand, which brand is less expensive than the other, all right? So I have to write the generic name, not the brand name of the drug. And V, I have to write the vehicle. How will he get this medication topically? Remember the vehicles. Will he get it as an ointment? Will he apply it as a cream? Will he apply it as a lotion? Dependent, right? And then the C is basically the concentration. Remember we mentioned concentration steroids. It could be 1%. So I can write in the concentration in the prescription, this patient will take topical or he will take corticosteroids, topical, 0.05%, for example. So that's pretty much it. And that's the things that you will write, especially for the pharmacist, all right? You will write it to the pharmacy doctor that you will, you will have this in this patient's prescription. His generic name, the vehicle, and the concentration. And then you go to the remaining part of the prescription, which you really say it to the patient more than the pharmacist, all right? Which is S-A-R. S stands for basically the site. Where will he apply the medication? You tell the patient, what will you do with this topical medication? For example, if you're gonna apply a topical cream, you can apply it in this area right here, for example, all right? You can apply it in this area or in this area specifically. Any specific area, you have to show to the patient where he will apply it, all right? And besides that, you'll tell him the A, the amount. How many creams, how much amounts of cream will apply in the skin? And how many times per day? right what is the duration how many times per day that's the meaning by really amount and site so s and a s for the site and a for the amount you can join them up together as basically explaining to the patient where will i apply this cream how much cream do i add how many times per day and for how long okay and then lastly the r is refills you basically write in your prescription how many refills for example in corticosteroids you might have three refills you can go to the pharmacy for a refill but typically, typically, especially in corticosteroids, when you use it for like two weeks, if you don't have any refill, especially in corticosteroids, tell the patient to stop. You have to tell the patient to stop because there are gonna be side effects that's a lot more common with steroids, especially when they're used for long periods of time. Okay, that's the meaning of refills. If you ran out of, if you have a refill, great, go get a refill. But if you ran out of refills, stop the medication. All right, you have to stop it. Come back to the doctor and then we'll see, uh, and then they'll see uh, how they will proceed, okay? So that's the things that you will write in your prescription for a topical medication. That's quite important, all right? And we talked about the types of the vehicles and what makes a topical medication effective. A, A, V, C, all right? Now let's talk about topical steroids for a minute. Now topical steroids are basically like 90% of drugs in dermatology, let's say. So to think about topical steroids, they're great. They're anti-inflammatory and they're immunosuppressive. And because of these two properties, they're basically used in almost all dermatological diseases, especially those that are not infectious. Because if you have a case of, let's say, folliculitis, you're not going to use steroids because this is a case of, this is a case of infection. If you use steroids, it will exacerbate the problem even more. Unless it's in a very, very, very severe case where the risks outweigh the benefit. But typically, normally, 99.9% .9 of the time, we use, they use steroids, really, we will all use steroids in case of inflammatory issues or autoimmune things. So, to really, to give an example, for example, in topical steroids, anti-inflammatory, they can be used in cases of eczema. They can be used in cases of, uh, in cases of eczema. They can be used in cases of atopic dermatitis. Any case where there's a lot of inflammation, we want to calm it down, we can use topical steroids. And they can be used in cases of dermatosis, 
which is another word for dermatological diseases. They can be used in cases where immunity is involved, like in cases of skin diseases like lichen planus, or in the cases of psoriasis, or in the cases of uh, really a lot of medications, or really a lot of conditions in general. So we talk about psoriasis and lichen planus and so forth. So these are things where Im the immune cells are involved and you can give steroids as well. All right? So the thing about topical steroids is they're great. And the thing that we need to keep in mind in topical steroids is that whenever you give a patient topical steroid, you have to make sure that it's most effective with the least amount of side effects. So the one way to determine that is you typically give the least potent steroid possible with the lowest amount of duration possible. For example, I'll give a patient a low potent steroid and I can give it for two weeks. And then we'll see how his, how his skin condition resolves. Let's say he has a skin condition like eczema and I give him uh, corticosteroids. So let's see after two weeks whether it resolved. If it resolved, stop the drug. And typically you can stop the drug gradually, not immediately because there can be rebound or flares. Stop the drug gradually and khalas. So that's a way that you can minimize side effects. If you give it topically for a low potent version of a steroid for a shorter duration, let's say less than two weeks. Because the thing is that we're gonna talk about shortly, corticosteroids have a lot of sides, a lot of side effects. And their side effects depend on whether you're gonna use a high potent steroid and their duration. So the higher the potency of a steroid, the longer you also use a steroid, the greater the risk of side effects. So typically the best way to determine a patient's outcome or patient's really his way of dealing his disease is when you give them topical steroid, make sure you give the least potent one possible according to the case with the least possible duration to avoid side effects. Now let's talk about topical steroids. Now we got an idea about topical steroids and uh, the ways they are useful and how to avoid side effects. Uh, the next one is going to talk about the classes of topical steroids. Now topical steroids are divided into classes or their potency, their effectiveness, their efficacy. They're divided into around seven classes, seven or eight classes. And they're divided into these classes from the most potent being class one to the least potent being class eight. And these potency of each class, the potency is not determined based on their concentration, no. Their potency is dependent on their active ingredient. So a corticosteroid, depending on its active ingredient, will determine its potency and not its concentration, all right? So that's something to keep in mind. When you look at the classes of corticosteroids, they're divided according to their potency. They divide them according to their active ingredient found in the medication and not the concentration. And the potency is divided into around eight classes. So you have class one, for example, clopidazole. Now clopidazole is given at a concentration of 0.05%. And that's a lower concentration than something like, let's say, triamcinolone, which is given at 1% concentration. Is triamcinolone, which is class three to class five dependent, is triamcinolone more potent than clopidazole? No, not because of the concentration. No, no, no. Clopidazole is more potent than triamcinolone because of its active ingredient. So that's something to keep in mind. And the class is divided as the following, class one, clopidazole, class two, flucinanoid, class three, triamcinolone. And triamcinolone typically has three different vehicles. You have an ointment, you have a cream, and you have a spray. Of course, the strongest vehicle for the triamcinolone is the ointment, all right? So that's why I have the letter three for the three vehicles, but the most potent being the ointment compared to the cream and the spray. And then the last one, starting from class six, or to class eight is hydrocortisone infamously, okay? What we wanna get from this is basically their indication. Now, corticosteroids are again used for cases of dermatosis. And with this potency, you can get an idea of their indication. If I have a case of a very severe dermatological disease, all right, like in case of psoriasis, very, very severe case of psoriasis, I will give this patient class one typical steroid, the most potent one, clobidazole. However, not everyone can give it. This is typically reserved for the dermatologist. The dermatologist will decide whether this patient has an indication of giving a highly potent class one steroid. Because the thing is, like we said before, the side effects of topical medications, especially steroids, they increase whenever you have a high potency, right? So if you give a high potency drug, there is a higher risk of side effects. So that's why a high potent class one 
the, high, the, more, the highest potency, this is typically reserved for severe cases. So this is one where a dermatologist will deal with and decide with, and this is used in cases of severe dermatosis. Now there's something also to keep in mind. When you apply typical steroid, do you apply it anywhere in the skin? No, it depends where. Now this brings me back to my point from way before in topical medication. When we apply it in the skin, is it going to be dry or is it going to be in a wet area? Is it going to be a hairy area or a non-hairy area? Is it going to be applied in a thick skin or, a, or in a thin skin? So in the case of class 1, or in the case of class 2 and class 3, all the way to class 5, all right? In both of these cases, from class 1 to class 5 uh, of corticosteroids, in, in these classes, we will apply it in cases of thin, not thin, yes, thin, or let's say, no, not thin, in sick areas, okay? We will apply it in cases of sick areas of skin, all right? Or areas of skin that basically, uh, that are not thin. And what I mean by thin is, for example, or a skin that's very smooth, like your, your face, for example. So if you have a picture of the face and a picture of your hand, all right? In the case of a picture of your face, you will not apply a class 1 or a class 2 all the way to class 5 topical steroid on the face, all right? Nor will you apply it in a wet area. We call it intratrigonious area, like your armpit, like your groin. You will not apply it in this area where the, where the skin is either wet or the skin is thin, all right? It's relatively thin. It's because if you apply this topical medication, it's very, very easy for side effects to occur. So, in the case of... Class 1 or class 5, you will not apply it on the face or in the armpit or the groin. But you can apply it in the case of your arms, in the case of your legs, anywhere but the face and especially the armpit and the groin. And in the case of class 1, you can apply it in the extensor surface of the skin. So the extensor surface here in the skin, you can apply class 1. But in the remaining classes, class 2 to class 5, the same areas, but you can apply it on the flexor surface of the skin, okay? So in the case of flexor surface of the skin, you can apply it the same areas as class 1, class 2 to class 5. But in the case of class 1, the extensor surfaces. So in general, class 1 to class 5, you will not apply it in the face or intertrigonous area, where it's very easy for side effects to occur as the face and the armpit and the groin, especially the pubic areas, they are very prone uh, to have side effects occur if you were to apply it there because the skin is thin or it's thinner, all right? We can apply it in thick areas of skin, especially in the arms and legs, anywhere, okay? However, in the case of class 6 to class 8, like hydrocortisone, in this one, no, it is the opposite. It's the opposite. Where in this one, you can apply it basically, uh, sorry, you can apply it basically anywhere else, all right? You can apply it in the face, you can apply it in the armpit, you can apply it in the groin, you can apply it in the genitalia. So hydrocortisone, it can apply anywhere else. And you know why? Because it's the least potent one. It's a very safe drug, a very low potent steroid. So I can apply it in thin areas of the skin, like the face, like the intertrigonous area, armpit and groin, for example, because this, the, the steroid is very, is very less potent compared to its brethren. So there's, less chance of a, so there's less chance of a side effect in penetrating the skin as the skin being thin, thinner, especially in this face. All right? So that's the idea. So the indications or the areas are different according to your class of steroids. The face is a no-no from class 1 to class 5. But from class 6 to class 8, no, the face is fine, the armpit and the groin is fine. The areas of the skin are the same uh, for the class 1 and class 5, but in the case of class 1, you apply it on the extensor surface of the skin, and in the case of class 2 class 5, you apply it on the flexor surface of the skin. Okay? That's pretty much it. Now, what about the side effects of topical steroids? The, what are the side effects people are afraid of with topical steroids? Of course, not every side effect is bad. Some of them can be therapeutic. The side effects can be divided into local side effects and systemic side effects. And regarding local side effects, they're one of the most important, starting with STSAH. S stands for skin atrophy. This can be bad. This is one of the side effects or topical side effects of steroids. So this is a bad thing, but it can be useful in the case of keloid. 
a keloid where we have an abnormal scar. So in the case of an abnormal scar where there's a lot of extra skin, we can use steroids in its side effect. A skin atrophy induced by steroids, we can use it in the case of keloid where the amount of skin in keloid that's the problem, we can decrease it, we can atrophy it, all right? So skin atrophy, S, is a side effect of topical steroids locally, but it can be a serpitic in the case of keloid where you have abundant unnecessary amount of skin. In the case of T, this is telangiectasia, it has no serpentic effect, which is dilated veins. S, the other S is basically, uh, the other S is basically another form of stria. Uh, S basically in stria, stretch marks. And you have basically different variety of stretch marks. And the idea with stria, you have stretch marks here, especially in the abdomen, and this occurs with collagen degradation. Basically, steroids are catabolic in nature. They can break down the collagen, and because they break down the collagen, they can lead to the formation of stria or stretch marks. And you especially see stria in the case of Cushing syndrome, for example. Besides the S, and that's of course not therapeutic, the other one is the A. And in the context of the A, the A is acne. So you might have a patient who has a steroid-induced acne. So if a patient has acne and he has a history of steroid used for a long period of time, you might think the cause of acne is steroid. And it, of course, has no steroidic effect. And the last local side effect of steroids is itch, which is hypopigmentation. And hypopigmentation is another side effect of topical steroids, but it can be steroidic in the case of hyperpigmentation lesions. Again. Okay. We can use it cervically in cases where the opposite occurs. Okay? So that's pretty much it for the side effects skin atrophy, telangiectasia, stria, acne, hypopigmentation. Now, regarding the systemic side effects of topical steroid, this is rare because, again, the absorption is typically local. But let's say we use steroids for a long period of time, with a long period of time, and let's say we have a high potent one, then systemic side effects can occur. And one of the systemic side effects that occur is GAC, all right? Now, regarding the GAC, basically G stands for glaucoma. This is infamous. One of the causes of glaucoma could be uh, steroids. Another cause could be cataract. And another side effect could be a case of cataract or glaucoma, according to which steroid, systemic, or topical. So G stands for glaucoma. And A stands for, uh, basically A stands for, sorry, the marker just dropped. But the A uh, stands for basically adrenal crisis or Addisonian disease. Uh, basically, if a patient used steroid for a long period of time and he suddenly withdraws the steroid, he can go into, an, into a known severe emergency case of Addisonian crisis. Basically, when you use steroid for a long period of time from exogenous, it will basically tell the brain to be lazy. I don't need to produce ACTH for my pituitary to produce more steroid for my adrenal gland. I don't have to do any of that. I can just take the source from the outside. So when I suddenly stop steroids, suddenly withdraw steroids suddenly, then this means that the body, who has no endogenous production of steroid, will be going into overdrive. Suddenly it needs steroids, it's not getting it from outside of supply, so it will panic. And it will panic in the form of adrenal crisis. So that's what the A stands for, adrenal crisis or secondary Addisonian disease. You have a deficiency of endogenous steroids due to long-term use of exogenous steroids. And the other one is C. Now C is a systemic side effect known as Cushing syndrome. You can have a case of secondary Cushing syndrome or iatrogenic Cushing syndrome, where again, a patient uses corticosteroid for a long period of time and he uses it in high doses. And this can lead to the production of Cushing syndrome. Patient may come to you with Kirsha. He might come to you with, abdomen, with basically a big, basically big belly. And this belly has purplish stria. And he has buffalo hump in the back of his neck, like a hump protruding out of his neck. And he might have his face look like, resemble like a moon. They call it moon face. And his skin might be very shiny as well. Especially his patients who use steroids for a long period of time. Their skin might be very, very shiny. All right, so these are one of the clinical features of Cushing syndrome that might occur as a systemic side effect of steroids for a long period of time. So G for glaucoma, A for adrenal crisis or Addisonian disease secondary, and the C is for Cushing syndrome, okay? These are the systemic side effects and the local side effects. And that's pretty much it for the steroids. Again, you wanna prevent these side effects, choose the least potent amount of steroid you can use, 
So as a GP, they can use class two all the way to class eight, according to the severity. If you have a severe case of a severe skin condition, you start with the most potent like class one, and then class two, and then class three and class five. If you have a case of a mild skin condition, typically the low potent one hydrocortisone is an excellent choice and it's very, very safe, okay? But again, to avoid side effects, choose the least potent one with the shortest amount of duration. You can tell the patient, come to me after two weeks. If there's no refill, come to me, all right? And let's say this patient, for example, let's say this patient, has, for example, has acne, okay? I give him steroid. Uh, or let's say this patient has eczema, I give him steroid. And let's say he has a case of chronic eczema and he wants to use steroid for a long period of time. In that case, I'll give an interval. Basically, for the, for the first two weeks, keep using the drug. Then, once the two weeks are up, stop using the drug. Stop using the drug gradually, take a break for the next two weeks, and then after basically a month's total, you'll come back to the drug. So two weeks you'll use the drug, two week vacation, two weeks going back to the drug to avoid, again, the side effects of steroids. So you can think of a vacation you can give to the patient, think of the duration, when will the patient stop, educate the patient, because some patients may continue to use steroids because of their skin, they might be shiny, and they like that, especially in women. And that's pretty much it, to avoid the side effects of steroids. Now the last thing we're gonna talk about is topical antifungal. Now, regarding topical antifungal, they are very safe drugs over the counter. They can be also, some of them may be prescribed, but really they're very, very safe drugs. They can be given without a prescription, most of them. And most of them are really used for superficial fungal infections. The topical antifungals, rarely will you ever, basically, rarely will you ever give a patient systemic antifungal, unless the patient has a teeny infection. If he has a teeny infection, you can give him systemic antifungal, meaning you give it orally, like griseofulvin. Griseofulvin is basically antifungal, drug of choice in teeny infections, for example. Or if you have a severe case of a fungal infection, you might give systemic. But most of the time with fungal infection, especially superficial types, Topical antifungals are preferable and they're very, very safe. And typically, they divide topical antifungals into but fungistatic and fungicidal. Fungistatic meaning they stop the growth of the fungi, but they don't kill it. And that gives it a very fast response. They don't have to think about killing the fungi. They can just inhibit its growth immediately. So it has a very, very fast response in comparison to fungicidal. Fungicidal means killing the fungi directly. So typically, a lot of antifungals that are prescribed are the fungistatic. They have a faster response, more convenient, and they're very, very safe. And one example of fungistatic uh, drugs that are given topically are your conozoles, like ketoconazole. And the conozoles are very, very safe. They can be given in cases of superficial fungal infections like C for candida or D for dermatophytes, again, teeny infections. So if you have a case of superficial fungal infections like candida infections or dermatophytes, mild cases, you can give conozoles. And another example of a fungistatic antibiotic could be polines. Polines like neastatin, neastatin. And neastatin can be given in cases of candida infection only, not in the case of dermatophytes. So this can be given in the cases of candida infections as well. So this is an example of, again, fungistatic drug. Now, if you go to the fungicidal, one example of it are the drugs that start with amides. Amides or nafim, like naftifine for example, or neftifine, anything that ends with neftifine, or amines. These are ones that are fungicidal and they can be given in the cases of dermatophyte infection only, D only. So some of these can be given according to the patient's case, but typically in dermatophytes, they, they tend to start with griseofulvin, a systemic antifungal. And in the case of candida, it depends. What, what do you want to start with? According to the patient's case, you might start with conozoles, typically they're very safe, or you might start with neastatine if you want. But overall, the topical antifungals, you just want to know, are they safe? Yes. And antifungals typically are given topically. They're safe, especially in cases of superficial fungal infections. They're divided into fungistatic, fungicidal. Know the examples of some of them. And basically know the infections. When do we give conozoles? In case of candida dermatophytes, some are only given for dermatophytes only, like this one. And some are only given for candida infections, like neastatine. But overall, they're safe, but we just want to be aware of them. That's pretty much it for the lecture Dermatological Therapies and I hope you enjoy.